All right, so let's finish up workers' comp. <clears throat> a few issues. The last issue we hit was fraud and system system of use. These two videos are less than 20 minutes long, so I'll count that as part of our classes. And then claims administration. <clears throat> we talked some about that when we talked about why firms buy insurance, even though capital asset pricing model, pricing model says not to. And part of that is the insurance industry is very specialized in this area. So essentially, dividing the insurance is almost like an outsourcing function. I definitely saw that at USA. I worked in our risk management area for just one week, but uh, I worked next to the department, interacted with them a lot, and I got the I got to see USA's workers' comp function. And the firm we dealt with was was so specialized in this that it really truly did greatly reduce our workforce. We it would have taken us three or four or five people to handle all this. Instead, we had, you know, 0.25 people. One person, part of her job was to work with the workers' comp insurance company. And boy, they managed the files. They made sure the employees were eager to get back to work, re eager to be re rehabilitated, uh, get the exercise routine, get over what the, whatever the fix might be. And they, they did an exceptional job. They knew our injured employees extremely well, what their status was. They checked in on them. That by itself was worth probably a, a good percentage of what we were paying in insurance premiums. <clears throat> the only issue with, with doing that outsourcing is if if the person interacting um, with the employee is too far away, then it, it, it can hurt getting the employee back. Um, so, you know... It depends. Uh, USA was in a large city, San Antonio, so there was probably their workers comp rep was probably in the city full time. But if your workers comp rep is in another city or another, or another area of the country, then uh, yeah, that, that could cause some delays in working with the employees. Um, so you have to react quickly because once employees become injured, there's a, a habit forming nature to workers comp where if someone's disabled, they somehow get used to that, and then it becomes very difficult to get them back into the workforce. Um, so you really want want to get the employee back within six months, or you might never get them back. <clears throat> um, if you don't outsource, you decide to do it all yourself. There are other services you have to provide that the insurance company has, like actuarial services. USA did have a few actuaries working for them outside of the insurance operations in their human resources area. They had one that did healthcare. And they had one that did um, their pension plan, but they did not have an actuary full time to help with workers' comp. <clears throat> so your goal is to get employees back as soon as possible, and that's that relates to the very last issue. Let me jump to the very last issue: return to work. Um, <clears throat> you have to create incentives for the worker to want to go back to work, especially lower paid workers who are maybe financially financially better off with workers' comp. They don't have to worry about losing their job because even if their firm goes under, their workers' comp continues to support them. Um, so a good return work program is going to focus on what the employee can do versus what they need to be able to do. So what is the job required versus what they're capable of? As you watch some of those videos, you saw people you know, pretending to have injuries they didn't have. Um, but that's important to the workers' comp. They didn't know exactly what the employees' capabilities are. And then match the job requirements to the employees' capabilities, which means they may not be able to do the exact same job they were doing, but at least or at least temporarily move them into another job so they're at least getting some productivity. And probably most importantly, that they're still getting in the habit of going to work, even if it's a lower functioning job. Um, you may need to provide rehabilitation services. That usually is very effective because the employees go to that and it gets into their mind that, hey, this is important. I've got to get better. I need to show some progress. <clears throat> so um, you have to work closely with the, uh, with the employee. <clears throat> um, and if the work, work has no desire to return to work, then the program may fail. So um, this is a bigger deal now than it used to be. It used to be firms would say, we don't want to spend money on rehabilitation services, but now many firms have done the cost benefit analysis and that's something that the workers comp is willing to pay for because in the long run it actually ends up saving them money. And then number eight, boy, this is my, um, one of my pet peeves. You've already heard me before. Why do we have disability insurance, health insurance, 
why do we have all these coverages and so many different insurances whether it's your um, your workers comp you buy get it from your employee employer you get it in part of your auto insurance why do we have all these different coverages and so the idea of 24 hour coverage is the employee is just covered no matter what the programs can figure out what it is but the employee comes in and they just know they have disability coverage and they have health ins coverage and they have life insurance and they don't go three different places people don't ask them hey were you on the job when this happened um, so they're all all these programs are blended together this is more common internationally the reason it's a struggle in the US is because of our federalist uh, system the states United States are very powerful and they have their responsibilities according to the US Constitution we'll talk about that a little bit later um, so they're regulated by the states whereas employee benefits are regulated by the federal government by ERISA and the two simply do not work together they don't have any incentive to work together uh, but boy, I would love something along this line of let's just merge all these programs together. Let's let's just make it part. If the firm's providing both disability and health care, then why why make workers come a separate program where an employee has to figure out when they were injured? So anyway, that's that's workers comp. One thing we work, mentioned with workers comp with the change in laws, uh, change in the way we work and. I want to address autonomous vehicles here. I could have done it under auto insurance, but I, I actually think it works better here because I think you're going to see how autonomous vehicles could radically change the workforce. So on Blackboard, I had several articles on driverless vehicles. I want to walk through these. It might, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get through this in this, in this session, but, um, but autonomous vehicles, I'm sure at least a few of y'all will make this your, Paper. If you do this for paper two, you can't just summarize the articles I provided. You need to find your own articles. The key is it needs to be related to insurance. You can have some background articles that give you some of the, the landscape of autonomous vehicles, but we need to focus on insurance. So I want to walk through self-driving cars overall in a generic way, what it will mean for us going forward, and then specifically what does it mean for insurance companies. <clears throat> So insurance companies have so far said autonomous vehicles will not have a huge impact on auto insurance. I disagree with that. I think it's going to have a very dramatic impact. But I think this is the key why they, where I disagree with them. They say their idea is autonomous vehicles, only difference would be in, instead of us buying cars we drive, we'll buy cars that drive for us. I don't think that's true. I actually think um, people will no longer own their cars and we'll see that later that cars will become car ownership will become a thing of the past and we will instead of buying our car we'll simply rent our car when we need it and autonomous vehicles will not be as expensive as Uber and Lyft or taxis because those services a, a large majority of their cost is the driver itself and so if you eliminate the driver rideshare becomes much much cheaper <clears throat> Um, the other thing the insurance industry argues, you might kind of list these out as we go, because if you're doing your paper, I, th I think this list of articles actually covers the issues pretty well. So what the insurance industry argues is, okay, we may have fewer accidents, but severity is going to be more. And the reason they say that is cars are going to be loaded up with a lot more technology than the autonomous vehicles. Well, that's probably too true. Again, if, if, we don't own the car, then that becomes an issue for whoever the rideshare organization is that owns all these cars. Um, but the other issue is all this technology that's being built for uh, autonomous vehicles, that technology is going to come down in price, especially over time um, as, as more and more firms, you know, there's one, there's one technology that's going to start dominating somewhat like um, Microsoft with, with, um, with uh, their particular software package uh, with Windows. <clears throat> so over time, all these things will start merging. They'll all be sharing artificial intelligence that's going to start helping. We're going to start finding that the technologies become much more standard, much cheaper. And so those costs should be coming down quite dramatically. 
So our the insurance industry says, hey, you may actually need new coverage, like cyber coverage. What happens if someone taps into your car and it does damage to somebody else? Well, again, if you don't own the car, that's an issue for the whoever owns all the cars, the, the firm that's renting out all the cars. So again, the insurance industry right now has their focus on autonomous vehicles that are being purchased by consumers versus a, a large corporation having a fleet of vehicles that it leases out. Um, we are going to, we already are moving more to this black box. It amazes me, as I told you in class, what my car is actually doing while I'm driving, collecting information. We talked about telemetrics and more and more our cars are collecting information. That information is getting fed back to insurance companies, to auto manufacturers. Um, and so we're getting more and more information about what causes accidents and that's just going to make us better over time. Um, <clears throat> they say driverless cars could be on the road by 2020. It depends on what they mean by that. We do have driverless cars on the road. I don't know if you saw in the news that happened after these articles came out, but there was actually uh, autonomous vehicle that hit a pedestrian and, and caused her death. There's been a lot of debate debate on that um, as you know how much she was at fault versus the car itself. Um, there have been, from a standpoint of frequency and severity, autonomous vehicles still have a very, very low accident rate. But... I think before we're going to trust them, I think the American public is going to demand that its accident rate be extremely low, and everything that the autonomous vehicle does that's wrong will be will be uh, magnified many many fold because people are just going to be nervous about the um, the technology. So, one there's several advantages we'll talk through here. One is that your driverless car can talk to other computers, so your car can figure out the best route. Not only can it figure out the best route, but it can also make sure that not every autonomous vehicle is also moving to that better route all at the same time. So if there's construction or if there's congestion, uh, you don't want 50 cars all of a sudden say, let's go direction this direction. So that's going to be interesting. Um, autonomous vehicles can drive much closer to each other, especially if they are interacting. So that's actually going to make um, highways much more efficient and even at the same time while at the same time making cars safer. Um, so let's talk about fewer accidents. The frequency is lower. Why? Because 95% of crashes are due to driver error. I think you'll see slightly different percentages in other articles. Um, you have teenage drivers, you have senior adults, uh, you have disabled people, even, even younger children. Um, you know, we'll be able to drive so you won't have teenagers driving kids, you won't have seniors driving after they should be driving. Uh, disabled people, that, that I know several people uh, that are blind or in wheelchairs that just cannot drive and this will give them some freedom. Um, we won't, people won't be giving, getting convictions for speeding in DWIs. So, you know, you think about that, it's great. It is going to greatly impact the budgets of cities that rely heavily on speeding tickets and uh, running stoplights and those kind of things. <laughs> But she says the insurance industry will not be obsolete. I agree they will not be obsolete, but I do think they, there's a potential for them to shrink 70 or 80 percent. The second article, I don't want to do much in the second article. I just want to hit a couple of things. Um, so the issue of this article is how much it's going to radically change many industries. So if you think back to the original cars, when the original cars came out, first of all, they were built to look a lot like a buggy being drawn by a car, by a horse. Um, and, and that's somewhat the way autonomous vehicles are working. People are thinking, let's just make them exactly like existing drive, driven cars. But over time, uh, cars, if they came in more and beaten, they, their designs changed dramatically. Um, and a lot of new industries developed, restaurants, highway systems, hotels, the whole world changed dramatically because of the original cars and people are saying autonomous vehicles are going to be the same thing. We're going to radically shift the way the world works. Um, these impacts will be unexpected. The cars will look different. There's no reason for them to look like what they do today. If there's no steering wheel, there's no reason for everybody to be facing forward. You might actually 
it might look more like a small conference room with tables facing each other with Wi-Fi set up and computers and you know nice seats autonomous vehicles are also challenged this is my main focus right here people may not buy cars so we own a car and the average car the typical car sits idle 96 percent of the time an incredibly unused asset um, Google, you're going to see very different assumptions in this part of the article. People have different assumptions and no one really knows. But Google said self-driving cars will um, mean we only need 30% as many cars a day. 30% of the cars we have today will be on the road. Um, so we can get the utilization rates up to 75%. So instead of cars sitting there 96% of the time, they only sit there 25% of the time. <clears throat> Um, we would also need much smaller cars to move the same number of people around. I mean, a much smaller number of cars to move people around. Uh, sorry, I misread that one. <clears throat> um, here's another one that said reduce urban vehicle numbers, urban vehicle numbers by 90%. Um, it's going to be transformational also, obviously, for car makers. Now, there's some people who say, okay, well, if we have fewer cars, then that's going to really destroy them. If we're going to reduce the number of cars that we need by 75 to 90 percent, they'll go out of business. However, it's important to remember if our utilization rate goes from 4 percent to 75 percent, these autonomous vehicles are going to wear out much faster. They're not going to last six, seven years. They're going to probably last only two or three years. So while there will be only maybe 25, 10 to 25 percent of many cars on the road, I mean, many cars owned at any one time, the cars that we own will be replaced more frequently because we're utilizing them much more heavily. So it's hard to say. Definitely there will be some reduction in the auto industry. Um, it's interesting that Ford changed its its mission from being an automobile manufacturer to being a mobility company. Um, their CEO lost his job because they couldn't figure out exactly what mobility company means. But um, it, it should be transformational for a lot of industries. <clears throat> Car industry execs, they insist that people will still want to own their own vehicles. We'll see if that's the case. Um, and this article seems to question that as well, if that's really the case. Um, car making is not the only industry that faces upheaval. And here it is, car insurance. It switches from millions of consumers to a handful of fleet operators. I do think that's possible. No one really knows. Um, but it is interesting that more and more insurance companies you can see here are actually putting autonomous vehicles into their SEC filings as a risk to their business. Um, so what will this do? The frequency and severity. Today, 94% of accidents, that's a similar number to what we saw before. I think, I can't remember if it was 96 or 94. That might be the same number. There's the American, American the National Highways uh, Traffic Safety Administration. We looked at some of their stuff earlier. Uh, the three leading causes of accidents are alcohol, speeding, and distraction. And distraction is obviously improving. I sure hope one of you will pick distraction as your paper, too. It's a very interesting topic. Driverless cars don't get drunk. They don't speed. They don't get distracted. Uh, so the number of accidents could fall from 5.5 million a year to 1.3 million a year. And road deaths could fall from 32,000 to 11,000. Once self-driving vehicles become available, some places may actually ban uh, driver-occupied vehicles on safety grounds. And I think this is part of what we might see over time. There may be several years there where people that's, there's a slow transition, but then you get to the point where 60%, 70% of the cars on the road are autonomous vehicles, but the other 20 30% that are dri driven are causing almost all the accidents. And I think there becomes pressure uh, those people, their auto insurance rates is, are much higher than anybody else's. They're very expensive. Um, I think over time, you, you might see that there's so much pressure that people just stop driving. And it might be a generational thing, too. Each age that comes up, uh, you know, kids get used to going at, at five, six, seven years old, get used to going to school and going everywhere, going to dance class or whatever, to soccer, or going in autonomous vehicle. Then when they get to high school, the idea of I want to get my own car and drive, that was man, a big deal, and when I was in high school, that may not be that big of a deal uh, for that generation. <clears throat> Traffic flow will imp improve. Um, you essentially will be doubling road capacity because these cars can drive so much more efficiently. Um, 
and productivity productivity gains. So to me, just think about it. Instead of getting up and driving to work at 7.30 to get there at 8 or leaving at 8 to get there at 8.30. So let's say you need to be at work by 8.30. Instead of leaving for work at 7.30 or 8 to beat all that traffic or get stuck in traffic, you instead leave for work at 8.30 when you're supposed to be there, but the first thing you do in the morning is you have a staff meeting. You're in your autonomous vehicle, your boss is in their autonomous vehicle, and your first hour of work is simply you and your autonomous vehicle, and you're actually getting work done, you're being paid for that time, you have another an extra hour to spend with your family. Um, I mean, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. You don't have to worry about transferring children to school. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And a lot of people, children, elderly, disabled, gain more independence. Um, parking space is a huge issue downtown. Um, you have 3.5 parking spaces per car. Uh, it can take up a, about a quarter of downtown areas and cities. And people looking per, for parking spaces is a big part of why people are driving around downtown. Um, Autonomous vehicles allow pe more people to live near the city, but also allow more people to live far away from the city because you're not wasting that time driving in. You're actually, that's product, product, productive time, or you're just sleeping. I, what they don't mention here, or I don't remember them mentioning here, is other industries like airlines. I see no reason why I would need to fly to Dallas if I could just instead get into a car at 10 p.m. with a nice bed, and just let the car drive me to, to Dallas real slowly. I don't care when I get there so I can save a lot on gasoline. Get me to Dallas. It's cheaper than an airplane. It's more economical from a, from a lot of standpoints. It's better for the environment. It's probably an electric car. You know, airlines are a huge part of a global warming and CO2 emissions. You know, there's so many things going on here. And you might not want to drive an autonomous car from, from San Antonio to Los Angeles, but... Anything that's within eight to ten hours, autonomous vehicle may be perfectly fine because you won't just be sitting there staring at the road. Um, so anyway, at the very end of this, I show you uh, what these these insurance companies put. This is the first year they started putting this into your annual report. You want to see what that first year looked like for that that risk of autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> All right. So next session, I want to finish up with this. Um, let's see, we went about 20 minutes, 40 minutes, you got about 15 minutes, so um, I'll move this to the next class, but I do want you watching those videos um, for, um, for the workers' comp and the fraud-related workers' comp, so I'm going to count that as part of this class 19, and then we'll start class 20, finish up um, autonomous vehicles, and then we'll probably be from there finished with all the commercial insurance and workers comp. So we're essentially right with the, the syllabus, maybe a little ahead, but not too far ahead. All right. Thanks.